I'm going to put two code snippets up on the screen, and I want you to tell me if you can spot the code smells that suggest using the builder programming pattern. Okay, here's the other one. Have a look for a second. Now, the number one question I hear about using game programming patterns isn't about implementation. It's about when to use them. I see it in YouTube comments, and I hear it from juniors at work. If you're new to the channel, my name is Adam, and I'm a senior software engineer. I use software engineering principles to build games better and faster. Let's get into it. Let's take a closer look at these examples, and we'll take note of the code smells that we can see in each of them. The first example of the enemy actually has two code smells. The first one is that there are too many constructor parameters, especially in the final constructor there. Anytime I see more than four parameters going into a constructor of an object, it's time to think about a builder. The second problem is telescoping constructors. So you can see that one is overloading the next uh, to pass in more and more optional parameters. This is another perfect opportunity to start using a builder. So let's fix this with a Fluent Builder. Now Fluent Builder is called Fluent because it's easy to read. What it does is stores all the properties required to actually build the enemy or whatever it is you're building and then has methods that return itself every time you set one of the properties. So we can set the name, we can set the health, etc. And we're always returning itself. We return the builder every time. And then finally, we have a build method. We'll create a new whatever it is we're building. Now, in this case, enemy has a mono behavior. Mono behaviors cannot be created using the new keyword. What we should do instead here is create a new game object. We can just call it enemy and we'll add the enemy component to it and set all the properties. Now you can see another issue here in the inspector and that is we've got private setters on all of these properties. Well, one way to do that that's very common is to have the builder class actually be a subclass of whatever it is that you're building. So I'm going to rename it. I'm going to call it builder and I'm going to move it inside of the enemy class. Now it's public. So if I come over here to the game manager, I can say enemy equals new enemy builder and then set all the properties that I care about. And I don't care about is boss because the default is false. Remove that. Now I can do whatever I want with it. I can instantiate it in the game. I could put it in an object pool. You know, think about using this for things like particle effects or anything where you need variety. Like suppose you're going to have a thousand goblins in your game. You don't want to have a prefab variant for every single different type of goblin there is. And as you can see, it's extremely easy to read. Coming back over to our enemy class, if we want to make this completely immutable, what we can do is just remove all these public constructors. Now, the only way that someone can create an enemy at runtime is to use the builder. Now this makes the object fairly immutable, which you may or may not want, especially on something like an enemy. But start to think about how you could use a builder to actually add components, which themselves could be mutable, where the core enemy object is not. So this builder can, in a sense, become a form of lightweight dependency injection. So you could say, implement an enemy strategy or a targeting strategy and inject them either as scriptable objects or add them as other components. Finally, with this kind of builder, it's a good practice to always have some default values set. Okay, let's have a look at our other refactoring candidate, and that was the multiplayer service. If we scroll down a little bit here in the class, you'll see there's this giant wall of code in the middle where we're setting all these options to be passed into our lobby. Now, this could scale up to who knows how many, 10, 20 different options. You might want to set some private data, some public, some just for members, some of it assigned to different indexes. So complex object creation is the code smell here. We've got data objects that have a huge variety of different ways they could be slapped together. And trying to read through this, especially once you get more than just the three we have on the screen, just becomes tiresome and it's unnecessary. All right, so to fix this, we are going to create a little builder and we'll call it, let's call it update lobby options builder. So unlike the previous builder, this one isn't gonna store a whole bunch of different properties. It's just gonna store the dictionary that we're gonna return. And as we add things through the builder methods, we'll just add them as entries into the dictionary. 
Let's start with a method to add public data first. Now Copilot has this just about right, it looks like, so I'm going to tab complete and then fix the uh, the index here really should just be default because we're, we don't want the default to be a specific index. Now let's actually jump into the data object itself and just have a look at its constructor. You can see the value can be default and so can the index. So I think for our purposes, we can make the string uh, value to be required. Now let's move on. We can make uh, a member data one and we can also make a private data method. And then we can just you have a build method which returns the new object. Okay, so now we have a Fluent Builder that hides away a lot of the complexities of building one of these options objects. So let's move it into its own class and come back into the multiplayer service. Now, right above the existing call, I'm just going to put another one here that uses the Builder. So we can compare the two here. You can see that the one using the Builder is 10 times easier to read and definitely less lines of code. So with that refactoring done, we can just remove this big wall of code that's building all those options. There we go. A thing of beauty and a joy forever, as my physics teacher used to say. So at this point, you're probably wondering, OK, I got a handle on when to use a Fluent Builder. When do I use just a normal builder, and what's the difference? The main time I would suggest using a regular builder instead of a Fluent Builder is when you need to enforce a sequence of things to occur. That could be something like you need to add a component or create a component before you can configure it. Now, a traditional builder usually comes with another class that's called the director, and the director is the class that actually enforces the sequence of the build. So why don't we just look at a quick example, and we can use the enemy class, actually. So for this example, I'll just create two classes, enemy director and enemy builder, and I'll put both of them into the enemy director file. As soon as we create a new builder, let's also create a new enemy game object and add the enemy component to it. The rest of the public methods here will simply be adding other components and configuring them. So let's have an add weapon component. Then let's have an add weapon strategy method that takes a weapon strategy scriptable object and configures our weapon. Then just for interest sake, let's add one more public method here to add a health component to our enemy. And this part's important. We're going to have a new variable built enemy and we'll assign our enemy into there because that's what we're going to return. Then we're going to create a new enemy ready for the builder to be run the next time. And then we'll return our built enemy. Up in the director, we simply call all these methods in the sequence. We'll pass in our builder, we'll pass in our data, and then we just call each method one by one and return the builder.build method. Now, we could build a little bit more validation in here just in case somebody set the director up in the wrong sequence, for example. So we could have a try get component. You know, as long as there is a weapon, then we can set the strategy, that kind of thing. Then we can get rid of this line down here. But ideally, you would have all of these things called in sequence. And I also realized that the add weapon component and add weapon strategy could really be just one method. But I've left it this way for the example. So finally, I want to show one last builder implementation, and that's using interfaces. Now, this is a little bit more complex, but you can definitely enforce the construction of any object in sequence by simply returning a different interface on each method call in the builder. Let's have a quick look at the interfaces, but I think looking at the builder will actually be the real eye opener of how it works. Now, if you notice, each of these interfaces only has one method, and that method returns the interface of the next interface type. So, iEnemyBuilder's method returns iWeaponEnemyBuilder, and iWeaponEnemyBuilder returns iHealthEnemyBuilder, and so on. You could have as many of these as you want. Now, down in the director, you can see all the code hints as the different interfaces are being returned on each line. Now, let's go down to the builder. Now, here our interfaces are going to enforce the contract of this object. So, our enemy builder only has one method, it can only add a weapon component. But an I weapon enemy builder can add a weapon strategy, and an I health enemy builder can add a health component. And the only one that can actually build the enemy is the I final enemy builder. So, if we come back up to the director and look at this, you can see the sequence of interfaces getting called one by one. There's only one way to construct this object. 
And that is exactly what you see on the screen here. So if you need an object that absolutely has to be built in sequence and nothing can be left out, this is a great option for you because interfaces enforce contracts. Let's zoom out a little bit here and have a closer look at the director and the builder together. Now, this one's not so bad with only four interfaces, but I think you can imagine it might be a little bit overwhelming if it had to implement 10 different interfaces. Nevertheless, you will see this pattern out in the wild sometimes, and it's good to know about it. You might make use of it sometime. So the way that we've got this set up right now is that we can get an enemy just by creating a new enemy director and using its construct method send in a new enemy builder and the enemy data. This isn't super memory efficient, however. What if we cache that enemy director? Once it's in a variable, we can call that instance of the director and grab our enemy from there. So let's move that variable up to be a field of the class. Now, even smarter than that would be to construct the enemy director with a new enemy builder. It doesn't need a new enemy builder every time. Let's pass that into the enemy director's constructor and store it in the enemy director, and we'll remove it from the construct method. This way, our game manager always has an enemy director just to construct a new enemy. All we need to give it is a scriptable object. The enemy director is always there, ready to churn out another enemy whenever we want it. All right, hit that like button if you learned something new today. I'm going to be making a few more episodes about programming patterns. So if there's a pattern that you're curious about or you just have questions about, please leave a comment below. And if you like that video, tap on one of those boxes on your screen and I'll see you in another one.